Okay, so let us get started. So, the topic for today is going to be communication in distributed systems. Okay, uh, this is actually a new topic and a new chapter in the book. So, I will start uh, with a little bit of background, then we will uh, talk about how processes in a distributed application can communicate okay, and we will specifically look at uh, remote procedure calls or RPCs today. Okay. Next time we will talk about, uh, well no, not next time, but two classes from now, we will look at uh, remote method invocations, which are essentially RPCs, but more in an object oriented uh, language. Okay. So, let us start with a little bit of background and uh, introduction. So, when you talk about communication, whether it is communication between two processes on the same machine or two processes on different machines. Okay. There are two kinds of uh, communication you can think about. Okay. One is called structured and the other one is unstructured. Okay. Unstructured communication essentially involves using memory buffers to pass information between processes. Okay. So, you might have a shared memory region on a, on a machine. Okay. Processes can read or write to that shared memory region, that shared across processes. So, you can write information in that um, uh, shared memory region and then some other process can use that information. That is a way of communication even though it is not explicit, okay. it is an implicit form of communication simply by reading or writing data that is accessible to multiple um, uh, processes. You could have also written data to a file. Okay. A process can write some data to a file, another process can read that data from a file and that is essentially a form of communication as well. Okay. All of these are called unstructured forms of communication okay, because we are using uh, shared data or shared files to pass information back and forth between processes. Okay. So, uh, the other form of communication is called structured which involves passing messages, network messages. So, you explicitly construct a message and then you send it to another process. That process could be on the same machine, it could be on a different machine, that does not matter, but you are using message passing to enable processes to communicate. Okay. Much of what we are going to talk about actually is going to involve today and for uh, several classes, it is going to involve structured communication, which involves some form of message passing. Okay. So, that is basically what, uh, and, but we will come back to unstructured communication later on. You will see that uh, that is also a form of communication, it will keep coming up from time to time. So, just keep that in mind. Okay. Now, it goes without saying that if you have a distributed system, okay, which means that your processes are running on multiple machines, okay, either of these forms of communication requires some networking support, because processes have to essentially uh, communicate okay, over a network of some sort, whether it is structured or unstructured. Okay. So, with that background, I am going to talk about protocol stacks. If you have taken any course in networking, this is kind of networking 101, but I am just going to cover it very quickly for those of you who may not have taken a networking class. Okay. So, this picture here shows you what is a protocol stack. A okay. protocol stack essentially is the component uh, that is used to enable communication over a network. Okay. Examples of protocol stack that you may have heard of are things like TCP IP, that is a protocol stack that is pretty common, is used for all types of communication over the internet. Okay. There are many other kinds of protocol stacks, okay. the, you can have Bluetooth protocol stack and other kinds of protocol stack, but they all form essentially a layered structure and that is what is used for communication. Okay. First, let us ask what is a protocol? The protocol is essentially a set of rules uh, for communication that both parties agree to. Okay. So, I said that at a very basic level, it is just a set of rules, but in, the, in our case, it will basically mean what is the structure of the message, what are the fields of the message, how should you interpret messages that go back and forth. Okay. Now, as you will see here, uh, the protocol stack, a typical protocol stack, and this is called the ISO protocol stack, has uh, seven layers. Okay. 
you go from the physical layer, data link layer, network, transport, session, presentation, and the application. The application is actually at the top of this protocol stack. Okay, so there are two applications in this case on two or two processes more, more precisely that are sitting on two different machines that wish to communicate. Okay, and they want to send a message. They'll essentially use this network protocol stack to enable that communication. Okay, but let's go through these layers quickly. Okay, physical layer essentially says what is the medium for communication. Okay, so you could use a wired network like Ethernet. In that case, the Ethernet cable is the physical medium okay, or the physical layer of the protocol stack. If you are using things like Wi-Fi, it's basically a wireless channel or cellular data using your phone. Then your wireless channel is the medium for communication. Okay, so that's your physical layer of the protocol stack. Next layer is called the data link layer or the MAC layer. Okay, so this layer decides how are you going to construct a raw message that you are going to send on this physical medium. Okay, that's the lowest level message. So if you are you if you use an Ethernet cable between multiple machines, the format of the message that goes on that Ethernet cable is basically decided at that uh, data link layer, and so are other things. If there are multiple machines that are all connected to that physical layer, who gets to communicate next and all of that is determined at that data link layer. Okay? So, the protocol that is used to enable that communication is called a data link layer protocol, link layer protocol. Okay? So, this would be essentially the Ethernet protocol in this case, for example, or Wi-Fi and things like that. Okay? Next layer up is called a network protocol. Okay? So, this is essentially going to allow us uh, to for machines to communicate even when there is no direct communicate uh, direct uh, link between them okay often uh, you will see that when two machines communicate there are a number of other intermediate nodes that are going to help you in the communication they are called routers okay because there is not a direct link between the two machines so they can't send a direct message they have to send that message through other nodes that are going to forward that message for you okay that forwarding process is called routing in networking terminology. So, this network layer protocol essentially implements routing. It also does other things like addressing. Okay? In the TCP IP protocol stack, the IP layer is essentially the network layer. Okay? That is the one that is going to figure out what IP addresses are. When you send a message, the routers are going to essentially use routing protocols to decide which node to forward it next and so on until it gets to the destination. Okay. So, routing is essentially going to be done at the network layer. Okay. Next layer up is the transport layer. Okay. So, this is essentially the end to end protocol. If you think of uh, network layer as being one link at a time communication, where what do you do next okay. when you want to send a message from A to B. Okay. Uh, transport layer is essentially looking at the end to end picture. Okay. How many packets were sent by A, how many of them have been received, how many got uh, lost in the network, should you retransmit those lost packets, what rate at which you want to send packets over the network, all of that is decided at the transport layer. Okay. In TCP IP protocol stack, TCP okay, which is a transmission control protocol is going to run at the transport layer. Okay. Is that clear? And then you have things like a session layer, which is going to look at a user session, okay, which is going to run on the transport layer. This presentation layer, which is going to look at how does this data get presented to the application. And then you have the application level protocol. Okay. Things like HTTP are application level protocols. Okay. You might have HTTP, FTP, all of these things that you might have heard of. They are all applications that are using this protocol stack for communication. So, with that very quick background on protocol stacks, let us take a look at a uh, structure of a message that is going to go on, uh, uh, go on the network using this protocol stack. So, I should mention one thing, uh, which is if application on machine A wants to communicate with application on message, uh, machine B, it is going to construct a message with a destination address. Okay, it is then going to hand that to the protocol stack. That message is going to traverse downwards one layer at a time. Okay. Each layer is going to do some processing on that message okay. and then it is going to go over the network. It is going to arrive at the other end probably through some intermediaries that are going to forward it which is not shown here okay. and then it is going to traverse up the protocol stack. Okay. Each layer is again going to do its processing and it is going to be handed off to the application at the other end. Uh, 
the arrows are taken from the book. So the question is, are the arrows wrong? One set of arrows have to go down, the other one needs to come up. But that's what the book had. So that's the picture here, right? So, so you will essentially have packets going down the stack and then coming back up. Yes, question? Um, I have a question about the same slide. Okay. Okay. Question is, can you do unstructured, it's a good question. Can you do unstructured communication if processes are on a different machine? And I gave an example of shared memory being an example of unstructured communication. If you are sharing memory between processes, the implicit assumption is that those uh, processes are running on the same machine so that they can access a common piece of memory on that machine. Okay. Now, that is indeed true. Having said that, you can actually have unstructured communication go across machines. In that case, your shared memory region has to be network accessible. Okay? Simplest example I can give you is you keep a file on a file server. Okay? You write process A writes to that file, process B on some other machine reads that file because the file server shares that file across machines, you can still have unstructured communication. You can also have distributed shared memory, which is memory shared across machines, but that's a lot more complex. The file example is the easier one to understand. Okay? So yes, it is indeed possible, but a little more complicated. Okay. So with protocol stacks, uh, in the picture, let's look at the structure of a message. So, so this picture is essentially going to show you what a typical message is going to look like when it is sent out over the physical layer, okay, when it actually goes out on the network. Okay. You will see that there is a part of the message which is labeled message here. That's called the payload. That's the part of the message that the application wants to send from machine A to machine B. Okay. If this was HTTP, you would include an URL or something like that in there. Now, each layer has essentially added a small piece to that message, which are called headers. Okay? So, if you have application level headers, in case of HTTP, you will add your HTTP header there. Okay? And then, if you come here, you will add a TCP header, you will have an IP header, you will have an Ethernet frame header, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, each layer is essentially tacking on a little piece of information to that message, and that, that message is essentially growing in length, and that is what is going to go out. Okay. When it arrives at the other end or maybe at an intermediate router, you are going to look at the appropriate level header to do your processing. Okay. So, at the other end, the Ethernet layer is going to look at the MAC layer header here and figure out what should you do with this message and then you will give it to IP, which will go to TCP and then eventually you will give it to HTTP and then maybe to the web server or the browser that is going to process it. Okay. So, essentially, you are going to add headers and then you are going to start stripping headers when the message is going to go up the protocol. That is typically how protocol processing works. Okay, question? Okay. okay, so now with that information, I am just going to start showing you a little more. So, typically in the TCP IP protocol stack, uh, you have transport layer, but there is really no session layer or presentation layer. You just have applications that run directly on TCP IP. If you have done any programming uh, or using a network, you know that already. Okay? But for the purposes of this class, we are going to actually add a layer between the transport and the application layer, which is going to be middleware layer. Okay, middleware layer would be a layer, piece of software that runs on multiple machines that provides useful services to the higher level application. And they would have a protocol for communication across machines. Okay, so, typically, uh, we might have sitting about transport layer, a middleware protocol. Okay, and we look at examples of middleware later on in this course, but keep that in mind. So, we have inserted one more layer, which is taking the place of what was presentation and session layers. Okay? So, that is one thing to keep in mind. Okay, what, uh, and then there will be many examples of what these protocols do. There is an example here, let us say distributed commit. So, if you have distributed databases that are trying to figure out whether to commit a transaction, you are going to use that protocol. Okay? And we will look at how to do distributed commit when we come to the next chapter. So, you do not really need to know what that is right now. Okay? Now, let us look at TCP, okay? because I kind of quickly introduced uh, TCP IP protocol stack. So, if you now actually start looking at how TCP works, 
okay? And now you must try to map it into our client server framework or how processes communicate. We will see that there are certain patterns that emerge and we will see whether they are uh, going to add overheads and what to do about it. Okay? So there are two pictures here. Both are timelines where time is on the vertical axis. Okay? The first picture is actually showing you all the messages that go back and forth between two machines A and B that want to communicate using TCP. Okay? So let us say web browser wants to set up a connection to web server. Okay? That is an HTTP connection. Okay? HTTP runs on TCP. Okay? In order for that HTTP message to go to the server, first you have to establish a TCP connection between the client and the server. Okay? And this is what is going to happen in order to establish a TCP connection. Client is going to send a message called SYN to the server which says, I would like to set up a connection. Okay? So that is a TCP SYN message that goes from the TCP layer on machine A on the client machine to the TCP layer on machine B. The web server and the client do not see these messages. Okay? These are this is TCP level message exchange, transport layer message exchange. So a rep reply is going to come back from the server saying I would like to set up a connection in the other direction because it is a duplex connection bidirectional and you are going to send an acknowledgement to the SYN that says act SYN saying I received your SYN message. Okay? In TCP the, pro the protocol says every message has to be uh, acknowledged so you know that the other end received it. Okay? If you do not get an ACK which is confirmation that your message was received then you have to retransmit that is the rule that you use in TCP because you want to ensure that any message that gets lost in the network is resent so that it is received eventually. Okay? So everything that we are going to send back and forth has to be acknowledged. So, so you will see that there is acknowledgement that came back for the SYN and the SYN came from the other direction saying I would like to set up a connection in the other direction. Client will send an act to that SYN. Okay? This is called a three way TCP handshake. Three messages go back and forth okay, in order for you to first establish that TCP connection. At that point, the client and the server have actually established a connection so they can do something useful. Okay, thus far, they, all they have said is let us set up a connection. Okay? Okay, so now having done this, the client is actually going to send a request. This could be your HTTP request that a browser has sent to the server. Okay, that is really an application level message that has now gone. Okay, it could be more than one packet. Okay, I have just shown one packet going, network packet going from the client to the server, but if it is a large message, you might have to split it into multiple packets. But for now, let us assume your entire HTTP URL fits into one network packet, so you sent off a request. Okay? And then the client can say, I am done, meaning that I sent my request. So you send a message called fin which says I am done sending anything I wanted to send, let us tear down that connection. Fin is basically going to do the opposite of what the SYN messages did which is to tear it down. SYN establishes connections, Fin tear it down. So Fin just says finished. Okay? Then an act comes back saying I received the request and I received that Fin. Okay? Note that TCP does not, does not have to actually acknowledge every single message. You can acknowledge a batch of messages saying I received all these messages. Okay? So you now acknowledge two messages here and then you send an answer. Okay? That is the reply you send for your uh, request. Okay? And then you send a fin in the opposite direction saying I am done. Okay? Then you get an acknowledgement back saying I got your fin so the connection is not torn down. Okay? So this is actually what is going to be happening underneath for just sending one request and getting one answer. So all you have actually done, the only useful work you have done in here is you sent message 4 which was the request and message 7 which was the answer that came back from the server. Okay? So 9 messages had to be exchanged in order for 2 real messages to be exchanged. But that is the overhead TCP is going to impose on us. Okay? Every time you have short communication, okay, you are going to pay the price of a 3 way TCP handshake to set up the connection, a 3 way handshake to tear down the connection and then all the acknowledgements that are going to go back and forth. Okay? So as you can imagine that is going to impose a high overhead. So there have been many attempts to actually optimize that uh, overhead. Okay? One of which is not to tear down the connection immediately because what if the client clicks on another link and sends another request to the server. Then you have to do this whole thing again. Okay? But in this case you uh, tore the connection down as soon as you are done with one request. Okay? So here is an optimized version of that same protocol exchange which 
I should mention was proposed as a, a research idea, never got implemented. There's no real TCP implementation that does this because it requires you to change how TCP works, right? Which is every machine has to change their implementation of TCP to say this is how we will actually exchange messages. Okay? It has the same handshake message, but you are piggybacking multiple requests in one network packet. Okay? Message one is going to say, let's set up a connection. So you include a SYN in there, you include the request, and you say, I'm done, fin. Okay? So all three requests actually go, or, or, uh, messages rather, go in a single network packet okay, from the client to the server. Okay? Then the server is going to send back a SYN because it has to actually send a SYN in order for it to establish a connection. Then it sends an act saying, I received everything until fin is going to include that answer and say, I'm done. Okay? And then there is an act that comes back. Okay? So you basically collapsed your nine message exchange into three messages simply by batching different messages, okay? which is going to give you less network overhead. Yes, question there. Uh, TCP, there's no TPC. Okay. Well, if I said TPC, that was a slip. <laughs> okay, so always TCP. Yes, question. Okay, it seems like a better method. Why is it not used? That's a good question. So you have to remember that TCP is a very general purpose protocol. It's not only used for HTTP, it's used for everything. You could say, I'm going to stream a movie. Okay. That connection may stay alive for two hours while you're streaming your movie from YouTube or Netflix. You don't have to do this, right? So it only makes sense for short-lived send a request, get an answer. So it is only a special case of all the types of communication that can actually happen over the internet. So you have to then decide how will you make sure it works in one case but not in the other and so on. This question there, yes. Okay, question is, could you implement that as a UDP layer? But to answer that question, I should say what UDP is. UDP is a different transport protocol, also runs at the transport layer. It's a part of the TCP IV protocol stack, except that it does not give you a lot of the things that TCP does. It will, for example, not give you uh, the ability to retransmit packets if they get lost. TCP will automatically do that for you. If your packet doesn't get to the destination, it will keep retrying and retransmit. And if you use UDP, it's going to send one message and then it's the application's job to figure out if it was received and it has to be retransmitted and all of those things. Okay? So if you, have, if you want less overhead, then you can use UDP, which means you'll just send that request. You don't have to even set up a connection. You just send the request and the, the server is listening, a request just arrives, and you have to figure out that the client actually sent it. If it did not get it, then you have to somehow know that it did not get received and so on. Okay, yes? What if, because you're essentially like making your TCP reconstructed or sort of backwards compatible, so could you make it backward compatible? Yes, I mean, there are many ways to make it work. All I'm trying to say is it never actually got implemented. I'm not saying it's bad or anything. Okay, yes, you could say, should you use the standard or then optimize all kinds of things. In fact, in data centers, there are actually papers that people are still writing saying, let's optimize TCP only for this case because that's a, quite a common case, but not for internet communication and so on. Okay, yes. So the question is, message six actually is acknowledging two requests, I mean, two, two packets the request packet and the fin packet. So this is just saying I'm actually acknowledging this range of packets, right? So TCP IP can say I acknowledge everything until they use something called sequence number, which is you don't actually say this. You just say I received everything until message five, right? So then everything until then has been received. That's all you're going to say. Yes. Okay, question is, can you have security attacks uh, by sending one message and getting the server to reply? You could have the same problem here. Okay, you could have all sorts of malicious clients making connections to servers. Okay, and uh, in fact, the overhead here is higher, so you will overload the server faster, I would claim, than that one. 
So, if you are a bad person, you should do the original. Yes, question. Uh, is there a formal name for the right-side? Okay, is the question, is there a former name for the right-side? No, there is not one actually. So, just a paper somebody wrote, but it's just to illustrate that there are high overheads of message exchanges and then there are ways to optimize that overhead. It was now not used, but we'll come back to this idea of batching when we think about RPCs. Okay. At some point, we'll talk about compound RPGs, RPCs, which actually batch multiple requests in one, just to reduce the network over it. So, this idea lives on in other forms, not this form. Okay. So, I'll say one more thing before we actually start talking about RPCs, which is what kind of architecture can the server and the client use for communication. Okay. So, there will be two canonical architectures we will talk about in this course. One is called client pull, the other is called server push. Okay. And you probably encountered uh, both of them when you use many different applications. The default one is what is called client pull. It's up to the client to make the request to the server first and then it's pulling a response from the server okay, that the server is going to reply to that request. That's called a client pull architecture. It's also called a request response architecture. Okay. So, you make requests, you get re responses. Okay. So, clients are essentially going to pull data from servers by making explicit requests. HTTP is an example, FTP is an example, many different protocols used examples. Okay. Now, there are pros and cons bet, uh, between the two architectures. Okay. Client pool architectures can typically be stateless because every time a request comes, you, you process the request, send a reply, then you are done with that client until it makes the next request. Okay. So, you do not keep state of the client across requests. Okay. You do not have to. So, you can make the server state less. Okay. The less information you have to keep about the client at the server, the more uh, re resilient you will be to things like failures. Okay. If the machine just reboots, okay, anything in memory is typically gone. So, if the client, uh, the server was keeping state of clients, it disappears. Okay. But if you had stateless server, that is not a problem. Okay. So, that is nothing to do with client pool, that is just a property of being stateless. Any, any stateless application is more resilient to failures because if you restart it, there is nothing you have to reconstruct. You can just start functioning as if nothing happened. Okay? So, stateless servers is an advantage here. Failures are easy to handle is another advantage. Okay? There is some limits to scalability because every response requires a request to go to the server. Okay? So, you have to make a request to get a response because that is the whole definition of a client pool architecture. Okay. Now, let us look at the server push architecture. Okay. As the name suggests, okay, the server is actually going to push data to you, to the client. Okay. So, you might not have to make explicit requests for the next piece of data. Okay. Video streaming works in this way, okay. not what you actually see in YouTube, but there are other protocols that actually work this way. You just hit play. Okay. And then the client and the server just starts sending that video file to you and the player just receives it and starts playing it out. Okay. Now, you could have implemented that in a client pool fashion where you say, okay, send me the next piece of that movie and send me the next piece of the movie and so on and so forth. Then you would have implemented streaming as a client pool system. Okay. But the server push says you simply send one initial request saying I am interested in this and the server will keep pushing data. Okay. That is one example. There are many others. Okay. You might have things like uh, stock tickers where you just have an application. Every time the price of that stock changes, the server is going to push it to you. Okay. So, now in this case, the server has to be stateful because it needs to know what the clients have requested and it keeps sending data to that client. Okay, so, you have to keep track of which client has requested what information, what movie, what stock ticker prices and so on. Okay. So, that is a property of server push architecture. They are going to be stateful, okay. which also means that they are less resilient to failure. It is the opposite of uh, client pool architectures, but there is a, they may, they, you can think of them as being more scalable because every piece of data that you send to the client does not have a corresponding request that you have to receive first and process. Okay. The number of messages that are going back and forth is less in server push because you registered your interest once and data is coming to you. Okay, yes, question. Is, okay, question is, is email uh, server push architecture. Typically, a mail client is going to do what is called periodic polling. 
Okay. Uh, you have push based email, but for that you have to have a special kind of server that will do push. Okay. A typical mail client, if you actually look at the settings, it will say check with the server every 5 minutes or 15 minutes is just pulling. That is actually client pull. But on the other hand, you have actually push. So, if you have phones that do push notifications, that is an example of push based architecture. When you get a notification from your app, that is actually pushed to you. Your app is not sitting and asking, do you have a message for me with the server? Okay. As the most common example that you might have seen in phones. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's a good point. So the question is, when we talk about scalability, what are we talking about? Okay. Because if you're stateless, maybe you scale more because you're less state. So that is indeed true. If you are actually talking about scalability from a state standpoint, client pool is going to win. Here we are talking about distributed communication. So I was actually referring to scalability from a network overhead perspective. Okay. So I should have qualified that. Okay, here if scalability could mean different things under different scenarios. But here we are simply talking about communication over it and scalability from that perspective. Is this clear? Any questions on this? Okay. Okay, we will keep coming back to pull and push based architectures. Now that we have introduced this, there will be many different applications where you will use one or the other. But with that, okay, there is one more slide before we talk about RPGs and that is actually group communication. Okay, group communication is a method that the network protocol stack supports, whereby you can send one message, okay, but there are multiple recipients. It is like a mailing list, sending an individual email versus sending a mail to a mailing list. If you send a normal email message, there is only one recipient or at least if you have one address in your email, one recipient, then only that one person receives it. Okay. But you send to a list, anyone who is subscribed to that list is going to get that message. Okay. Exactly the same concept is true when you talk about communication, okay, group communication. You can actually send one network packet to a special IP address okay. and multiple recipients are subscribed to that IP address. That IP address does not belong to one machine, it is just a virtual address that essentially takes that message that has been sent to that address and delivers it to multiple recipients. Okay. So, what this does is from a sender standpoint, okay, if you want to send a message to 20 recipients, you do not have to send 20 messages. So normally, you would say send this message to recipient 1, then you say send it to my recipient 2, you will do this 20 times if you have 20 recipients that are interested in it. Okay, but if you use group communication, you will send it one to the group address and the network takes care of delivering it to all recipients who subscribe to that group address. Just as if you have subscribed to a mailing list, the mail server figures out who subscribed to it and delivers the message. You do not have to send it individually to everyone on the list. Okay. So, this is called group communication. Okay. Uh, there are other terms for this. If you heard of the term multicast, okay, that is essentially what group communication refers to. Okay. You also have something called broadcast. That is a special kind of group communication where you are sending the message to every, everyone on the network. Okay. If you send a broadcast message on a network, every client that is on that network will receive it. Typically, you only do broadcast at a LAN level. You do not do global broadcast that would not work or scale, but you can essentially do broadcast on a LAN within your Wi-Fi network or within your Ethernet. Okay. There are many kinds of broadcast messages you can do. So, when you do DHCP and get an IP address when your machine boots, that is a broadcast message that goes out and then you get back an address, for example. Okay. So, there is broadcast that is a special type of group communication, but here we are talking about multicast which is a message is sent to a subset of nodes on the network okay, that are part of a group. Okay. With that, let us move on to remote procedure calls. Okay, I will essentially describe what they are, okay, how they work and I uh, will also show you a little bit of example code at the end of the class to give you a flavor of how they work. So, let us start thinking about what, what are we trying to achieve. Okay. So, now we are talking about distributed communication in this, uh, in this lecture. So, we are trying to figure out how as a programmer, you can write a distributed application where multiple processes reside on multiple machines and they communicate. Okay. You could write your application at a very low level 
which is you use what are called network sockets. Okay? You actually have to know something about TCP IP, how it works, you set up a TCP connection, you write all of that code in your application to set up a TCP connection and then construct a message and send that message and receive it and so on. Okay? That is one way to write network application. Okay? Okay? From our perspective, that is like programming at an assembly level. Okay, yes, you can always program any code at an assembly level, but you do not want to deal with lots of low level details, you want to program at a higher level of abstraction. Okay? So, question that we would like to ask is how can you write distributed applications by programming at a higher level of abstraction okay, and then not have to deal with some low level details of how networks work or what even TCP IP may be and so on and so forth. Okay? So, let us ask how would we do this. Okay? So, you could think about how can you enable this. So, one so one approach is to think about how do people write uh, programmers rather, write code for a centralized application. How do you write a typical uh, program? Okay. So, ideally you would when you write a program, let us say as a Java program or Python or whatever your favorite language is, you think of writing it in a modular way where you have functions or methods in your program. Okay. You take the structure of the program, you split it into smaller functions or methods and methods will call or functions will call one another. Okay? You already know how to write code in this fashion, that is how you write a typical program. Okay? The idea behind RPCs is why not use that same concept to allow you to now program in a distributed system. Okay? What if you could write your code as a set of functions, okay? your program is a set of functions but they do not all reside in one process or one machine. Some functions reside on one machine, some functions reside on another machine, but functions can still call one another. Just as you can call any function or method in your centralized program, what if you could call function foo, except that code for foo is not in this process, it is somewhere else. Okay? But when you write this code, you just call foo as a programmer. You do not actually say where does this reside, do I have to set up a connection to send a message to execute foo, none of that. You just call a method. It just happens that this method is remote, it is not local to your machine or local to your process. Okay? So, now you are invoking remote procedures or remote functions. The functions actually live in other processes on other machines. Okay? But since you already know how to write code, okay, when you write centralized program, it makes distributed programming very easy, okay? because you are just trying to take the structure of your application, split it into functions or methods and it just so happens that in this case, they do not all live on one machine or live inside one process, they are distributed, but you do not have to worry about it. The system, the runtime system and the OS takes care of those details for you. Okay? So, the insight here that uh, the, these designers of RPCs came up with was, if you want to elevate the level of programming, you already make people do what they know. You do not have to teach them anything new and let the system figure out all the complexities now in the runtime system. Okay? So, now you can just write application programs as if you just wrote a centralized program. Okay? You have to still figure out what functions live in what machine or what is in the client, what is in the server, but beyond that you do not really deal with a lot of the low level details. Okay? So, here is an example, okay, which is a figure that shows us an add method. Okay? It is a client machine and the server machine. Okay? We have implemented the add method in the server machine. Okay? So, the code is actually code for add is in process that runs on server machine. The client is simply going to call the add method with two arguments i and j and is expecting a response, which is the sum of i and j. Okay. Normally, if that code was on that uh, for add was in that function, you would just make a function call to add and then you would execute that add and get back a reply. Okay. You have to do the same thing here, except that to invoke add, you have to actually now do something over a network. Okay. But the programmer is not going to do anything other than just call add i and j. Okay. And then that call is going to go into the runtime part of your application, which is called a stub. Okay. That stub code is not actually written by the programmer, it is auto generated by a spe special compiler for you. Okay. That stub code is going to figure out this function is not a local procedure, it is a remote procedure. It is going to construct a message which is shown in this box here saying the procedure to invoke is add, it has two parameters, they are both integers, that is the value of the first parameter as the value of the second parameter. You would make this message, okay. you also figure out incidentally where the server is running. 
Okay? You set up a TCP connection to the server okay? and you send this message over the network. Okay? It arrives at the other end. The stub will figure out here is the message that's arrived to invoke a certain procedure. It will unpack that uh, message and then figure out that the client actually wants to invoke add. Then in the stub code, you are actually going to invoke add with the right parameters. Okay? Then that function will run. Okay? It will produce a result. That result will come back to the stub code. It's going to make another network packet, send it back over the network. That packet is going to now arrive here. Okay, and then you are going to and, and all this while add is simply blocked, waiting for a reply. Just as when you call a function, wait for the function to execute until a reply comes back. Okay, and then you just send a reply, which is the sum of i and j, okay? and then you are done. Okay, so now you essentially implemented a distributed application just by calling a function and writing code for that function. And everything else, all of whatever is happening in the stub, okay, is neither written by the programmer nor do you have to know what is happening underneath. Okay? All of the networking and messaging is taken care of for you. Okay? So this makes it very easy to write distributed application. Because something else, in this case the runtime system and the compiler for RPCs is doing some heavy lifting for you. You are simply writing distributed applications as set of functions that are being invoked on different machines. Okay. Is this concept clear? Okay. okay. There are many other details we will get to, but this is the basic idea behind remote procedure calls. Yes, question. So if we have, uh, if we have functions that we to the Okay. The question is, if you had two fun remote procedures, maybe both are called add, okay, or maybe they are called different things, it does not really matter. How is the client going to know where the server resides? Okay. That is always the first problem when you have any distributed application. Where do you, how do you know where the server resides? Okay, there has to be some way. Okay. Typically, there are many ways. One is, of course, you can hard code the IP address of the server, say, I want the add function on that machine. It is not the best method because if the server runs on some other machine, your code will not work. Okay. So ideally what would happen and we will talk about this in a moment is when the server process starts up, it is going to register itself with what is called a naming service. Saying I am a server, I am going to expose the add, add service. Okay. So when the client starts up, it is going to call the naming service and says I need a server that can provide an add service. Okay. And then the, the naming service will say, such a server is running, it is at this IP address, or this port number, that is how you communicate. All that is again happening in the stub code because the, so, so a little bit might have to happen depending on the programming language in the uh, client code that you write, but most of it is dealt for by, by for you. Okay. Yes, question there. Okay, question is, is the naming service handled by DNS? No, typically this is not DNS, that is an IP lookup service, we will talk about that as well. There is an actually a RPC service that runs, uh, it may be called RPC port mapper in Unix for example. Okay, the specific service meant specifically for RPC program, it is only providing naming for RPCs. Okay, yes. Okay. Okay. The question is, how are you going to compile this? I'll actually show you a sample snippet code, which tells you how to do this. The start answer is that when you write this client and server code, you also, as a programmer, have to say these functions are essentially remote procedure. Not every function you write becomes a remote procedure. You can't call any arbitrary function that resides in any process. Okay, you have to decide which functions are essentially remote and invocable and then you create a special header file which says these are the ones that I am going to allow someone to invoke on the server. That header file is actually used to generate uh, extra code and to do syntax checks and other things that you are going to link okay, as part of the stuff. We will look at an example to show you that in a little bit. Okay? But let us look at the timing diagram of what is happening between the client and the server. Okay, the client, the, the, uh, here the x axis is time, the dark line say that that entity is executing, dotted line says it is waiting. Okay? So initially the client is executing, the server is waiting and the client makes a request 
okay in this case it calls the add function which is a remote procedure okay and then that's going to result in a network message that goes to the server server is going to process it and reply while that is happening the client is actually blocked on add it's waiting for add to return with the response just as when you call an add function you are going to jump to that function and the call caller is going to block waiting for the callee to finish same uh, semantics apply here okay once the reply has come then the client will continue execution okay so this is synchronous communication okay blocking communication okay so i should mention that uh, this concept was actually proposed in the 1980s okay it was actually someone's phd thesis which i have a copy of we are interested in but uh, uh, it then basically became uh, popular in industry and now practically every operating system and programming languages as well actually support some form of rpcs okay so let's talk a little bit about uh, how you are going to send these arguments and what are some issues that might arise in rpcs and so on so what is shown on this picture is just a local procedure call okay you should all know this if you have uh, uh, used any programming language so here is the main program and this is the stack of that main program whenever you call a function foo okay which has some parameters you are going to essentially push those parameters on the stack okay so essentially you have a few some parameters and your your return address and local variables and within that function that's how you are going to access those parameters saying this are these are the arguments being passed to the function okay so you essentially you stack as a way to pass information between the calling function and the called function okay that's how things are going to work in local procedure calls and what not and then of course if you have global variables they are going to reside on the heap of the program okay now in rpc is things are not that simple okay so if you think about how parameters are passed generally in any programming language there are two methods okay you are passed by value and passed by reference okay passed by value essentially means if i am going to pass two arguments i and j i make copies of those variables okay and i pass those copies to the function that is being invoked okay pass by reference essentially means that i am passing pointers to the variables that are being in passed okay so if in the called function you actually change the arguments if you are passed by reference the original variables will change if you pass by value the original variables are not changed because you passed a copy you are only changing the copy not the original okay that's basic uh, programming language okay now as far as rpcs are concerned okay you have to realize that you can only essentially implement call by value okay you can't do call by reference because the call function is on some other machine so you can't say here are two variables i and j that i would like you to add here is the memory address of i and j on the other machine that memory address is meaningless because those are pointers pointers are essentially memory addresses that point to addresses on the other machine okay so you can by default most rpc runtime systems will only support call by value not call by reference that will be relaxed in certain cases but by and large you only have to pass parameters by value okay that's one limitation that rpc systems will have this is simply because looking up memory addresses across machines is complicated or hard to do is that clear okay all right so so that's one thing that we are going to uh, have to keep in mind so what that also says is if you are passing a complex data structure as an argument let's say you pass an entire array as an argument okay if you are just writing a local function you could pass a reference to that array not have to make a big copy of that array in this case you have to make a copy no matter what okay if it's a 10 megabyte array with 10 million entries you have to make a copy of all of that uh, values of that array and send it over the network okay that's the price you are going to pay for making it easy i mean the programmer is of course not doing anything it's the runtime system that's doing all the work but that runtime system has to do all of that extra work because pass by reference is not going to be supported okay so that's one issue the other issue of course is you can't have global variables either in your program because global variables are again not meaningful when your program is split across multiple machines okay you can't say global variable i is on that other machine how do you look it up okay so you can't do that either okay yes questions so if your argument is, uh, uh, is actually a graph yes 
Okay, that's a good question. The question is, what if that ar argument you're passing is a graph which is the same as a complex data structure? Okay, so if you have any complex data structure, let's say two-dimensional array graphs and whatnot, you have to do what is called linearization. You have to make a sequence of bytes that represents that graph that has all the information in that graph by traversing the whole thing, send that over, and then reconstruct that graph at the other end. Okay. This is, a, we'll get to that, it's called marshalling and demarshalling, as a quick mention here. Okay. So, so essentially, you have to send that entire graph. Okay. But remember that since you're sending a network packet, that graph has to become two-dimensional. It's just a sequence of bits that you have to send over the network, and then you have to reconstruct its structure at the other end. Okay. All of that is also complicated, but the system has to take care of it for you. Okay. So, we'll talk just about that in a moment. So, so here is what the client and the server stubs are going to do. Stub is the part of the program at the client and the server that's doing all the heavy lifting. Programmers are not the ones writing that. It's auto-generated code that you simply link to your application. Okay, special compiler will generate that code for you. Okay, so that's the one that's going to make the, uh, the network packet, send it over and so on. Okay, but there's a lot of uh, uh, complexity involved. Okay. So the first thing is exactly the question that was asked, which is you have to package parameters. Okay. There are simple parameters like integer values, floats, that's not hard, you just send the value. Okay. But what if it is a graph? What if it's a complex struct okay, that you're passing? You can even pass objects. If you do Java program, you could pass an object. You have to then take that entire object, which is all of its state and the code and send that over. Okay. So it can get complicated in uh, sending parameters, that process of sending that parameter over as a package called marshalling and demarshalling of argument. Marshalling essentially means take any argument you pass to a remote procedure okay, and then linearize it, construct a sequence of bytes that represents all of that information in that argument, send it over. Demarshalling says interpret that sequence of bytes okay, and reconstruct that uh, whatever you sent, whether it's a graph or object, at the other end, exactly the way it was on the sending machine. Okay, so that's something that your runtime system, in this case, the server stub is going to actually do for you. Okay, I did mention that there is a special compiler here, which is called the RPC compiler, that is going to auto-generate that code for you. Okay, to auto-generate that code, you have to provide a specification of your RPC. What is this RPC? What is its name? What are the arguments and so on? And you use a special language to do this, which is called interface definition language or an IDL. Okay? Once you specify that set of RPCs that the program implements, your compiler will actually generate the stub code for you. Okay? And I'll show you an example of uh, some very simple add implementation, the same example that I showed you, how you can implement that as an RPC. Okay, but any questions on this so far? Okay. So, we talked about marshalling of arguments, okay, but there are many other issues, but let's talk about the steps that you have to perform okay, in order for the client to invoke a remote procedure. Okay. First, the client program is going to process, rather, is going to call the remote procedure. Okay. The remote procedure will immediately transfer to stub code because you your stub code will realize that's not a local function, that's a remote function. Okay? So you basically call the stub, the stub will actually make a message call the OS. Okay? The OS is essentially going to send the message to the remote OS. Okay? What is not said here is before all this happens, when the process is start up, they have to essentially figure out the IP address of the server and setting up TCP connection and whatnot. Okay? That's not shown here. Okay, but that's already been done for you. Okay? And the remote OS will give that message to the stub. The stub will unpack the parameters and send that to the call the server. The server will actually execute the called function, the remote procedure, send the result, and then all of the return steps. So basically, these are all the steps I showed you in that pictorial add function. Okay? All of that is actually happening underneath. Okay, now let me tell you a little bit about other complexities that might arise. Okay? So I said you can marshal and demarshal arguments. Okay? You can take parameters, construct a network message, send it over. Okay? Let's take the simplest parameter you can pass, integer. Okay? Let's just say add as two integers that you pass. Okay? Now, even passing this two para, a simple thing like an integer comes with its own complexity when you have RPCs. 
So, for the complexity arises because we have made no assumption that the client and the server machines are identical in their hardware architecture or OS or anything like that. Okay. In fact, RPC systems allow them to be different. Okay. They, you do not have to say, I can only call code that is in, on a Linux box running on Intel machine. Okay. You can call, the server might run on Windows platform, you may be calling from a Mac, you may be calling from a phone, it does not really matter. Okay. So, the first thing is RPC systems support heterogeneity. Clients and servers could be different architectures, different operating systems. Okay. Now, the moment you say this, okay, there are all these additional complexities that are going to arise. Okay. There is a good thing that you can support heterogeneity, because now you do not have to make any assumptions about where is the client machine, what does it run and what does the server machine run. Your code is going to work across platforms. The problem is the following. Okay, if the architecture, even the hardware architecture is different, that might cause all sorts of problems. Okay. So, for example, any architecture that you have is going to either use what is called a little Indian format or the big Indian format. Okay. Little Indian is going to say that the most significant bit is going to be read left to right and big Indian says the other way. Okay. Now, if you send an integer, a 32 bit integer, which is just bits, 32 bits, okay, which, how is the server going to interpret it? If it just uses its native format, but the client was a in a different using the other architecture, you are going to read that integer backwards and use a different value altogether. Okay. Minor detail, but it actually matters. Okay. So, how do you deal with this? How can you actually send an integer to any arbitrary machine and have it still read the right value at the other end, regardless of architectures? Yes. You can what? Okay, you can just choose one, okay, that is indeed right. So, what you have to do is basically, whenever you send a message, you translate it into a well agreed format, okay, which is called external data representation or XDR. Okay. This format, every, every machine that will implement an RPC system will agree to. Okay. So, let us declare that all XDR formats are big Indian. So, now if you are little Indian machine, when you actually marshal the argument, you have got to flip the bits and send the integer in the right way. Okay. When you receive an XDR message, you take that architecture and you uh, basically convert it into a native architecture if it is different. Okay. So, if you agree to this rule, then everything is good, because you are sending it on XDR format and we just said XDR is always big Indian, okay. which might necessitate a local translation if you are a little Indian machine. If not, you just send it in the right format. Okay. So, every data piece or data that you are going to send, you have to first convert it into that format. So, in addition to marshalling it, you also do a conversion if necessary, if your architecture is different from the XDR architecture. Okay. And at the other end, you might have to do a reverse conversion. So, this allows you to communicate across architectures. Okay. So, these are all the low level details you will have to deal with for you to make RPC calls uh, across heterogeneous machines and whatnot. So, once you do this, it does not really matter, the hardware is different. And the same is true, it will also say that this is a 32 bit integer or a 64 bit integer that is coming to you. So, you can interpret it accordingly. Okay. So, the type of the argument that is being sent will be described for you. Okay. So, you know what that argument is okay. and the format it is sent is also described for you. Okay. And as I already said, we do not allow passing pointers as arguments. Okay. Pointers are just a way to do pass call by reference, because the pointer is meaningless at the other end. Pointer is simply a memory address okay, to some data structure. Okay. You pass a memory address, what is the other end going to do with it? Okay. If it looks up that local address on its machine, that is going to have garbage, that is not the original location. Okay. So, you do not actually allow passing pointers as arguments. Okay, that you completely disallow in RPC systems. Okay. You can still call local functions with pointers, you just cannot use pass pointers as remote procedures, okay, arguments remote procedures. Okay. So, the last piece of in, uh, thing that we got to think about is, how is the client going to locate the server? Okay. If you just write the add functions, the add i j and invoke it, Okay, the stub code has to figure out where that server is. Okay. And as I just mentioned earlier, 
you are essentially going to use a naming service. Okay, so, uh, so that's also called a binding service. So the method by which you locate the server is called binding. Okay, you bind to a server. Okay, you will typically use a naming service to implement binding. Okay, what does binding mean? So, or how does it work? So, when the server starts up, it's going to export its interface. Okay, saying I am server X. Okay, I have five remote procedures I would like to export or expose to the world. First one is called add, the second one is called subtract and so on and this has the, you take so many arguments and so on and so forth. So, so you will essentially declare your interface and you register yourself with the binder, which is essentially a naming service. It's just a special term in RPC world, but at the end of the day, it's a lookup service. Okay? So you are going to register yourself with the lookup. When the client starts up, the first thing it is going to do is essentially going to look up, send a message to the lookup service and say, this client program is essentially going to call the following procedures. Where is the server running? Okay. Since the server has registered itself, you know the IP address of the server, the port it's listening on and so on. The lookup service will tell you that and the client stub can then establish a connection with the server. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. So then you should ask how are we going to find the lookup server? Okay. Yes, where is the binder running? <laughs> How do you know where the lookup server is running? If you would you hard code that? Okay. So that's an interesting question as well. Uh, you can of course locate it by broadcast saying first you send a broadcast message on your LAN saying is there a lookup server running? Is there a binder running? Okay. If so, then you are basically going to get it or your system administrator may have said here just as how, how do you find where a DNS server is running? It's actually configured by, for you by your system administrator or sent to you as part of your DHCP. You can use any number of methods to tell the client saying here is the lookup service for this network. Okay? That's an orthogonal way uh, issue, but yes, you have to first know where the lookup server is running in order for the server to register itself and the client to look, at, look up the server. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So now there are many issues with the bio naming services which we will come to when we talk about naming as a general principle. Okay. There are many things. If there are many RPC uh, services running on your network, there are many clients looking up uh, or making remote procedure call, the naming service might become a bottleneck. Because there are many things registered, many lookups happening. You can make the naming service distributed. You can use replicate the naming service. All of those things we'll talk about when you come to distributed naming. How do you build a scalable distributed naming service? Same problems are going to arise here because this is going to have the same issue of scaling. Okay? If you have a single naming service, at some point it will become a bottleneck. Okay? And then you got to resolve that. Yes, question. Uh, Okay, so that's a, another good question. The question is, once the server registers itself with the binder, okay, how does the uh, binder know that the server is still running? How long will it keep the registration? Okay, what if the server stops running, crashes? Is it going to keep that entry all the time? Okay, so again, that is an implementation issue, important one, but an implementation issue where you might say the registration is valid for some period of time or you got to renew it or you can send heartbeat messages there are many different ways. By default, it is, the entry is going to stay in the binder. Okay? But of course, if you keep it there forever, it is not going to work because the server is not going to live forever. Okay? So there has to be a way to deal with making sure that the entries in the naming service are valid, that they actually point to servers that are actually running. Okay? So that is a good question as well. Okay, so before I talk about some issues of failures, I want to show you a quick demo of how you can actually implement RPCs. Okay, so here is a very simple ad. Can people in the back see this? It's too small. Let me make that bigger. Okay, so here is essentially our ad application. Okay. There is an ad client which is going to make the ad request. There is an ad server that is going to essentially implement a remote procedure which is to add 
and then there's a third file called add.x that's going to be a definition of RPCs. That's our interface definition for the RPC that we are essentially going to use to generate stub code. Okay? But before I actually compile it or anything like that, let me show you what is in each. Okay? So this is our uh, add.x which says that the, the, that's the program, that's the name of the service. It essentially implements one function called add. Okay? There is a pair of integers and then that is basically going to have two vari variables a and b that you are going to pass as argument. Okay? That is just a definition saying that is the RPC that this program is going to implement. Okay? And every RPC that you are going to write in the server or servers if there are more than one have to be specified here. Okay? This is a specification file. Okay, so, now let us look at the server which is basically just this code. So, as you see the server essentially has the add service, okay, it is going to receive something and then it is essentially going to add them here and send back a result. Okay. It is going to print it and all that, but that you can ignore. Okay. That is your entire server. Okay. You will see that there is no networking code here. There is nothing that says that that is a remote function, that there has to be any connections made. If you are writing this program yourself using network socket, you would have to write code to set up connections, accept messages, all of that. That is not even written here. You just written that code. Okay, that is the only thing you are going to write in the server. There is a question there? Uh, maybe I will come back. Okay. Okay, so, now I will sh just show you very quickly the client code. A little longer, but not that long. Okay, there is a main function. Okay, this is going to take some arguments, which we do not have to worry about here. But that is the part where you are going to essentially do a binding lookup. When you say client create, that is where you say I would like to say, uh, look up this thing at the binder, but essentially the call is here. Okay? So, you just basically say add 1 which was the version of add and then you essentially passed an argument which has a struct that as a and b. Okay? Again you will see that that is the client code, you will see that is entire main program and others there is no mention of networking at all. Other than you basically did one look up to the binder to say that I would like to make sure I read look for the server up. So, this is all you are going to write for the client and the server to communicate. Okay, and then what you are going to do is you are going to essentially call a special compiler called RPC gen. You call it with the your specification file add.x. Okay. And then once you do that, it is going to auto generate a bunch of code for you. So, that is all the stub code that got generated. So, that is the XDR code okay, which uh, actually does not have much because it calls libraries. Okay. So, essentially it is going to just call some XDR stuff which we you do not really need to even read this. Okay. It is auto generated code, you just compile it and the program just works. Okay. But then you can actually look at other auto generated stub code like this one. Okay. So, here is all the extra code that gets generated for you, there is not anything interesting here. Okay. So, that is the add service. So, here is some extra thing that is actually going to. So, here you will see things like send reply and there is a transport protocol. So, these are all calls to a RPC library to set up the connection and things of that sort. Again, all auto generated for you. So, you will see it will get the argument, there will be XDR code that packet packages it and so on and so forth. Okay. So, and then you can set up socket connection, well not you, but the stub can set up socket connection. You will see that it is registering itself with the binder using the service register call and so on. Okay. Yes, question. Is there a way to tell the, the RPC not to send stuff over to the add? Um, or something else that the pointer is pointing to? Like, uh, come again, what is the question? So, let us say that I really want to get this to the object, but it has a pointer to its parent and then the parent has lots of money. Right. So, so your okay. So your question is, can you pass some arguments where some parts of it have pointers in it? Is that your question? Like a struct with some point. So you can always pass something, uh, anything. It's going to be passed by value. Okay. And if there is an actual pointer in that data structure, that will be meaningless at the other end. So when you write code, you shouldn't actually send anything that has a pointer in it. Typically, as programming practice. That is the way, otherwise, I mean, the, that pointer does not actually make sense on other machines. But well, during the, the marshalling, I thought it was, it was pulling in all of the different uh, 
different objects that have that are part of this complex data structure. Right. right. So the question about marshalling is you are going to essentially marshal the data structure that you have because you have to declare the data structure. The data structure has pointers in it. You can't marshal it by definition because it's not going to chase all the pointers and construct something for you. Okay. That's not how it would work. You have to have an actual data structure that is, doesn't have pointers. That's the thing you can send over a network. Okay? Yes, question. Well, was the, I think the um, server approach and kind of an extra argument had some extra arguments. Okay, let me just bring up. The question is the server code had some extra arguments. I will put this code up so all of you can play with it. Uh, these things? Okay, so that is something that the RPC needs you to do, okay, where the, the result actually comes back, in, not, not the result, that so for the request to be constructed. Okay, there's uh, some uh, uh, convention that requires you to actually have these additional things in addition to the arguments that you're passing, okay? But you don't actually do anything with it as you will see in the code. You just have to pass it so that you can send some, uh, uh, send some information back from the service back to the sub code. So on the client side, it, it's, it looks like it's more transparent because you don't need to add extra arguments, but on the server side, you always need yes. to add. Yes, but no, remember that this is C. Okay, you, you know, if you use more modern languages, things are more and more transparent. You don't actually have to do some of that is taken care of. Yes, because C is actually not that transparent. You have to do a little more work, not a whole lot. Yes, there's a question in the back. So if you are actually running this in a distributed setting, which files would you want? Okay, the question is if you are running this on distributed machines. So first of all, this is how you are going to develop your code. You are going to develop maybe client and the server together, but you don't have to. If the interface is specified, somebody else can take your uh, .x file and write their own client because so long as they call that function, that's all you need. Okay, but if you are writing the client and the server, you would write the code. And what, what I compiled actually gave you two binaries, the server and the client. Okay, this one you can run on one machine. That one you can run on a different machine. Where will the add.x The add.x, once you create binaries, is not needed. You can already construct executables. Okay, that's only needed for the compilation phase. You have a special compiler that, if I'll show you what happened. Right, so... So you see that what happens is the first thing, before you call the C compiler, you call the RPC compiler. That takes the add.x and construct all the stub. Then these stub files are simply compiled as C files and just you make essentially two binaries. Once you create the binaries, then you don't need the code at all. Okay, you just run them. Okay, so let's just move on and uh, just talk about the last module, which is going to be more implementation details and a case study of uh, RPCs. Okay. So the thing I did not actually talk about, which now becomes important, is the processes that clients and servers represent live on different machines. Okay. What happens if something crashes, something does not work? Okay. If you had a centralized program, okay, if something goes wrong in the program, entire program crashes and terminates and everything stops working. Here, your application is split into multiple processes. Okay? Some parts of them might crash, others might stay, the network might misbehave. So you have to deal with all of these issues in an RPC system. Okay? So, so this slide and the next one is going to go through some of these cases and show you how you can figure out what to do if you are writing your RPC system, not as an application programmer. Okay? This is as some a designer that's writing your own RPC system. Okay, so first thing is, client cannot locate the server. You start up the client, contacts the name service, name service says no such server. Okay, that's clearly an error, can't do anything. Okay, you just say uh, server is not running. Okay? So now let's assume that client and the servers are running, but and the client has made a request to the server. Okay? Your RPC request may get lost on the network. So then what is the client stub to do? Okay. So in this case, the client stub is actually going to implement timeouts and retransmit. Okay. Now the reason you have to do this okay, is that the RPC system also doesn't make any assumption on what protocol it's going to run on. Okay. If it runs on TCP, you don't need to do this because TCP is going to timeout and retransmit for you. 
Okay. So, the protocol is going to take network protocol will take care of it for you, but the default RPC systems actually ran on UDP, which is the sister protocol of TCP that did not do any error recovery or anything like that. So, you could just send a message, it may not arrive at the other end. Then you got to actually deal with it at the stub level and do take have timeouts and retransmit and so on. Okay. And the same thing might happen when the replies get lost. Your RPC request reached the server, the add message went to the server, server executed add, send back a reply. Okay. The reply they never came to the client, it got lost on the network. Okay. Now, if the client is going to simply time out and send that request again, you are going to go re-execute and send that reply. Okay. Normally that may be okay, okay, but in many cases it may not be. If the RPC actually changes state at the server, okay. suppose the RPC request was add 100 dollars to your bank balance, okay. your ATM has actually made a request to the banking server. Okay. Now, if the reply gets lost and you retransmit it and you add that 100 dollars to that balance again, which means you are actually changing a file or a database, your result is going to be wrong, because you executed that RPC call twice okay, and it has a side effect. Side effect is actually changing state on the server. Okay. So, if you actually do retransmissions, you got to make that operation item potent. Okay. Item potency means no matter how many times you execute that call, it will have the same end result. Okay. So, you essentially have to write your system in an item potent fashion okay. or you have to make sure that your RPC runtime system is guaranteeing item potency. Okay. Typically what it will do is it will actually keep track of the ID of the call and you will see is the call being resent. If you have already executed it, it actually has cached the reply, it is not going to execute the call again, it takes the reply and just sends it back. Okay. It has a reply cache, that is the simplest way you are going to do it. But you might have to actually make sure the code is item ported, which is a burden on the programmer, okay. not on the runtime system. But if the runtime system does this for you, you do not have to worry about. Okay. So, some additional details you have to think about. Okay. Now, your server itself, in this case, these were network failures, but now you may also have server or client failure. Okay. So, server may go down okay, and restart. Okay. What do you do if it actually is, was executing a call and it fails in the middle? Okay. Now, you got to, if again the client might time out and make that request again. Okay. Now, if the request executes successfully, you would ask what is it that I know about that request that has happened on the server? What is the server guaranteeing to me if eventually I succeed in getting the server to execute my request? Okay. Now, the server might give you any kinds of guarantees which go from at least one to exactly one. At least one semantic says, if I get a reply to my RPC call, okay, the server has executed that call at least once. Okay, that is a given, but it could have executed it more than once if I had this case where the reply was lost, I sent it again and it executed, eventually I got the reply. Okay. So, at least one is not giving you any guarantees at all, because that is kind of obvious. If you got a reply, it should have executed at least once, but it could execute more than once. Okay. At most one says that if you get a reply, it is executed at most once, okay, which is almost the same as saying it is exactly once. And there could be no guarantee, which means it may never execute at all. So, you have to decide when you write your RPC system, what are you going to guarantee to the client if it gets a successful reply. Okay. Because this has implications on should you make the code item important. If you get exactly one's guarantees from the RPC runtime system, programmer does not have to do anything, because it is guaranteed that the call execute only once. Why do you have to make anything item important? Never going to execute more than once. Okay. But if you have a RPC system which only gives you at least one semantics, there is a good chance that as a result of re resending the request because of network failures, the code may execute more than once at the server. In that case, the programmer has to make sure the code is item potent if it maintains state. If it is stateless code, you do not have to worry about it. But if you maintain state, you got to make it item potent. Okay. So, there are all these details you have to worry about and then I will talk quickly about client failures and we will end. So, you might also have client side failing. The server is running, but the client fails, it is made a request waiting for a reply. Okay. So, here by, by and large, it is up to the server to decide what to do. Okay. This is called an orphan RPC. The orphan RPC means that the caller has actually failed and it is basically orphaned at the server. Okay. So, the simplest thing is you basically essentially make the client stub 
tell the server saying that the client process died. Okay, the runtime system will notify the server, the server will then kill the computation, not send a reply. Okay. That's hard to implement, so you might have other approaches that says, okay, I will actually have periodic checks, okay, which are called epochs, and say, is there a long running computation from the previous epoch? If so, I'll just terminate it, because the server may not be running, or I'll explicitly check with the server, okay, which basically says, is the, uh, or rather check with the client, saying, is the client still running? This is like sending heartbeat messages saying your RPC has been executing for 15 minutes, it's a long running RPC, is the client still alive? Okay. If it's not alive, why continue? So you keep checking with the client, so long it's alive, you keep continuing. Okay. Or you might have expiration times on the RPC, saying this RPC will execute for at most one minute. Okay. The code takes longer than that one minute, you got to ask the server client saying, should I continue? And then renew that one minute timer and have another timer. All of these cases, the server is checking with the client when there are long running RPCs to make sure it is fine to keep executing the RPC. If the client has died in the middle, there's no point continuing and wasting CPU cycles at the server. Okay, so these are all methods to accomplish that. Okay, so we'll stop here for today, continue next time.